Hello everyone, in this video we are going to be doing another case study of a cloud-based architecture. In this video we are going to be learning about this article which is how Dropbox saved millions by building a scalable metadata store on Amazon DynamoDB and Amazon S3. This is part of the case study section of the AWS website where they take a look at how certain industry leaders solved a technological problem using cloud services, in this case using Amazon Web Services. So there's quite a few interesting kind of tidbits of information in this article. I'll leave the link to it down below in the description of this video so you can read it yourself. Um, but you can come here and read this yourself or you can watch this video where I'm going to basically uh, kind of describe to you what happened here in terms of their problem and their solution and basically the learnings that you can take away from it. So that is the goal of this video. So we're going to do kind of a, a Blackboard session here just talking about uh, the problem that they faced and the solution that they used to solve that problem. All right, so of course we are talking about Dropbox and if you don't know about Dropbox, they offer kind of cloud hosting for storage so you can store your personal files there, even certain uh, companies or industries use it. And so this problem is all about data storage and running out of space for their data storage. So let's dive into it a little bit and let's scroll down here to make some real estate. And so Dropbox uses a pattern where they have a, or used, I should say, a pattern where they have an on-premise data store. Uh, so this is their on-prem data store for Dropbox, at least at the time. And in this case, we are talking about storage of these kind of entities called metadata records. So metadata records. Um, they didn't really talk a lot about this in the article. I had to look them up uh, separately on the uh, Dropbox tech blog. But basically, metadata records correspond to metadata about files and folders, files and folders that you store on the cloud, so on your Dropbox account. So anytime you upload a file or a folder, there's certain metadata that's associated with it. So for example, which partition it's located on internally in Dropbox, when it was uploaded, when it was changed, the contents of it, so on and so forth. Now the second kind of utility of this metadata service is for the purpose of internal and external services that uh, Dropbox provides. So internal and let's just say external services that Dropbox uses to power its service. And essentially what was happening in this uh, kind of world or in this problem that they were facing is that when they're storing and like requests are coming in this way into their on-premise data center, when there's records to write and read these metadata records, they used a setup where they had a sharded um, sequence of databases here. So they had separate MySQL databases that were sharded uh, using different, uh, I would assume different like customer IDs. So storing different customers on different components or on different pieces of MySQL databases. And so if you don't know about database sharding, by the way, you can go and watch my video I have on it. It describes this concept in detail, but essentially the gist of it is you separate your data onto separate instances so that you can scale horizontally. And so this was the setup that they had now um, kind of doesn't look like it's a problem at face value. You can easily just add more uh, databases if you want, if you have more customers. But the issue was in terms of the storage that they were running out of. And there's this concept in the industry or in data storage in general of hot data, hot data. And then there's the opposite of hot data, which is you would imagine, uh, which is cold data, cold data. And so hot data is generally the data that is kind of uploaded most recently. So recent data or fresh data, and it's accessed often as well. So it's got very common access patterns, at least in the beginning. And generally it's just like kind of more relevant data, at least for a certain period of time. And then conversely, cold data is like more old data. So kind of less than one day, less than one week. It really depends on your application. Uh, it's less relevant, less relevant. Uh, and it's kind of rarely accessed. So very uh, rarely is basically anyone looking at this data set. And so herein was the issue. It was with the cold data. So essentially what was happening was that the cold data, as time was going on and on, that data was accruing. So if you think of kind of here's your storage tape or your storage um, kind of meter. And so what essentially was happening is that um, you, know, you have a little bit of data here that's hot and, and accessed more and more often. And then you have cold data, which is basically uh, filling up the remainder of this spot here. And if you imagine that kind of your hot data shifts into cold data after one week, then that means as time goes on, so if you have like another tape here, as time goes on, so time is going 
uh, on in this case, then basically your cold data starts taking up more and more of the pie, starts taking up more and more of this pie where the large majority of your costs are now being eaten up by your cold data. And so this is where the issue was lying. It was with that cold data. Um, so based on the article itself, they had less than two years, so less than two years to make a decision, or at least before they were going to run out of data on this MySQL uh, on-premise uh, data cluster that they had. So this is the issue that they ran into. Um, so essentially they had three different options. The first was that they could like 2X this thing. It would accrue quite a bit of cost to do this. Uh, so add more kind of nodes here, order more hardware and then set them all up. Uh, the other option was that they can just kind of delete certain portions of the data. So going back to this diagram down here, like what if you just like chopped off um, all this and just erased all that, then you would kind of free up your storage uh, for basically any time in the future. So this would all be kind of free space now from here to here. Um, and so that was an option too. I'm not sure what the customer experience would look like, but probably not good. And then the third option was to uh, kind of pursue a different managed solution that was not going to be on premise. Uh, so that's what they ended up doing. They ended up migrating to the cloud where they wouldn't have these scalability concerns. So that's the problem that they were running into, essentially running out of data storage and it was particularly due to cold data. So that's the issue. Let's take a look at now the solution or how they got around this or how they overcame it using AWS. And so what they ended up doing was they ended up building kind of a code name service. It was called Alki, A-L-K-I. Don't think this means anything particular, but it's an interesting name. And so they ended up wanting to separate out their hot and cold data onto two separate storage systems, onto two separate storage systems, so hot and cold. And so what this would allow them to do is that since these are now separated, they can scale these independently and potentially use different AWS services for the hot portions of data and for the cold portions of data. And so for the hot portions of data, what they ended up doing was that they would create a table every day. So on day one, they'd have this table and all the records that were flowing in, like all the write requests and the read requests uh, would were for this particular day would hit the hot partition. And then at the end of the day, they would basically replicate this table into their cold storage uh, using some kind of asynchronous replication process. And then they would delete this table and then create a new table for the next day. And then all the writes for the next day would exist on table two and all the reads that were relevant for this particular day all went to table two. And the reads that were intended for the previous day would now start going to the cold storage. And so they also created a router here that would decide how to route the traffic. But we'll come back to this in a second. And in terms of the technology choices for the hot data storage, they ended up using DynamoDB, DynamoDB. And for the cold data store, they ended up using S3. This is where they would persist the object long-term uh, or for queries that were for relatively old data sets. And so in terms of what the flow looked like for the write and the read, you can probably guess it yourself, but let's just run through it. I'll do writes in this orange color here so you don't lose track. So a write request comes in. Ooh. That's a little strange. Okay, so a write request comes in, and then basically it's pretty straightforward. We're always going to write to the DynamoDB table because it is going to store the hot data, the data for today. And any event that takes place is always going to be for the given day. And then from there, from the read perspective, it's a little bit different, so let's do read in green. So a read request would come into the router, uh, essentially inspect this request. If it's for any records that exist for today, we would look at DynamoDB. And if it's for any records that are kind of less than today, we would look at Amazon S3. Now, one thing that I didn't mention that I wanted to very briefly is that when I said for the hot data where they were storing all the records in a separate table here, this was actually six different tables here that they were storing their records in for the hot uh, data. And this is per day. So six separate tables that they were storing. And for each of them, they would store between five, uh, 50 to 80 GB of data per day. And they would do 6K writes per second approximately 6K writes per second. So some some fairly spectacular achievements here but in terms of the scale. Uh, and this is a very common uh, kind of pattern, by the way, separating your, out, your data out onto separate tables so that you can achieve better scale. This concept is horizontal scaling. 
And in terms of some of the other improvements that they were trying to make, um, the first one is they wanted a more efficient process to do this, to do the replication process. Uh, originally, they were using a script to, I assume, just like pull the data in DynamoDB using like a scan operation or something like that. Uh, then they were looking at how to do EMR or use EMR to speed up this process. In this day and age, you'd probably use something like Dynamo Streams. So Dynamo Streams. Uh, you combine that with a Lambda function to get item level records per, um, well, all the event changes per record. Then you can put that into S3. Uh, using Firehose. So you can pump that data into a Firehose stream and then that'll deliver all your data into S3. Uh, so those are the, some of the improvements they were looking to make. This is the one I would probably suggest today, but since the article is kind of old, uh, maybe this wasn't supported or there's another reason they didn't do this. Uh, also in terms of some of the benefits or some of the um, kind of more positive things they got out of doing this operation, uh, they were able to do this in less than a year. So that was an achievement. They didn't have to expend any costs for expenditures in terms of their on-premise data center. They can do a kind of the metered billing that AWS lets you go with uh, when you're using the AWS cloud. And they also solved their scalability problem, their scalability problem. No longer are they worrying about running out of storage. Uh, using this kind of setup, using Dynamo and S3, they're able to basically scale to uh, however much data they need to without having to run into any types of problems. So that's how Dropbox was able to move from on-premise to the AWS cloud and also achieve scale and lower costs and do it relatively quickly as well for a tier one service that serves hundreds of thousands of customers per day. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. If you like this style, I have another video just like this one on how the Prime Video Tech team moved from serverless to monolith. You can go and check that out. It's on the right hand side here. I'll see you next time.